Dr. Cassie from NABC's Vetfolio and the host of vet to vet Well, there are a lot of anesthetic options out there and everyone no doubt has their favorite cocktail. The rising scarcity of certain medications makes it incredibly important to stay up to date on current and new analgesic options. Joining us today is Dr. Matt Reed. He's a board certified specialist in veterinary anesthesia and analgesia at MedVet Columbus, where he's been part of the team since 2018. And he's also the anesthesia specialty leader for all MedVet locations. So hello, Dr. Reed. I'm so glad you're here to talk to us about this today. How exciting to have a new option. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Cassie. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. And yeah, let's have a good chat about what, uh, what options are available. That sounds great. I'm really excited to learn about this. So let's just start with kind of common reasons to sedate. What are some of the most common reasons to sedate our patients? Yeah, I mean, any practitioner um, who's dealing with small animal patients, dogs, cats, knows that there's going to be a, a range of patients that come in with different personalities, different disorders. Um, so probably the most common types of things that we're using sedation, either light sedation or heavy sedation for is going to be um, anything from physical exams on patients that are too fractious to, to perform an exam on safely for either the pet or the person doing the exam. Um, might be diagnostic procedures, might be collecting blood for uh, investigation into you know, metabolic issues, um, could be um, any sort of imaging procedure. We do a lot of sedation for taking radiographs, for example, uh, performing ultrasounds. Um, we do a number of CT scans under sedation now to try and minimize the impact of anesthesia and, and cost on the owners while we're planning certain follow-up procedures. Um, so yeah, any number of different things, you know, skin issues, um, you know, minor procedures, um, you know, that fall into the surgical field, you know, biopsies of things, small excisional biopsies, for example, um, you know, laceration repairs, depending on where they are and what the patient's uh, underlying issues are. So wide, wide range of procedures that, that I think most of us are pretty familiar with. Um, and as you said, in your introduction, we've all got different ideas of what the ideal combination might be for those different things. Yes, absolutely. Kind of what works best in our hands. And I feel like, I feel like you're describing my day yesterday. Um, I had a pity who was bouncing off the walls but needed x-rays because he ate a chicken bone. And sure enough, we found the chicken bone in there. And then another one who needed a little bit heavier sedation um, to have an abscess flushed. And another one who didn't need sedation yesterday, um, but she has a pretty severe cardiomyopathy and um, also a mast cell tumor, how to do that safely for her. So like you mentioned, all different reasons, all different levels of sedation and, um, and different combinations for each one of those. So let's dive into that in a little bit more detail, um, the considerations or the different considerations for sedation for maybe a quick minor procedure versus something heavier like that abscess flush. Um, can you touch on some of the differences to keep in mind when we're choosing a sedation protocol based on the type of patient we're seeing. Sure, yeah, and I think that's probably the key is, you know, patient signalment is, is often the first thing that, that I consider as an anesthesiologist. I always kind of recognize the things that increase risk. Um, we always kind of consider sedation to be safer than a general anesthetic, but in a lot of respects, it's actually not true. Um, with sedation, we're not necessarily protecting the patient's airway um, we may or may not have intravenous access with a catheter to support them with drugs or, or other modalities. Um, so when you look at, you know, the big, big studies, sedation is still a risk to the patient. Um, and then there's certain things that increase patient risk um, of complications. So first things I always consider is the patient species, you know, dog or cat. Um, you know, they have different personalities, different challenges, different responses to certain medications. Um, certainly the age of the pet is going to be important in that in terms of the kind of things we think might actually be happening behind the scenes in them, um, whether they've had previous experience with certain drugs. Some, some animals we know have a history of having certain, you know, dysphoric recoveries or something. Um, so any or all of those, you know, points are important. And then any diagnostic tests that we have, you know, the results of blood work might change how we look at a patient, whether they have underlying kidney issues, uh, physical exam findings. You know, not all heart murmurs are treated equally. Some heart murmurs are the result of 
um, you know, a change in the heart that we can still safely use certain drugs like alpha two agonists, whereas other heart conditions, we definitely want to stay away from an alpha two. So all of those things kind of feed into it. And I think that's kind of where we each have our, our personal cocktails our personal favorites is we kind of know what works for us under certain conditions, but, you know, always being aware that there's going to be exceptions and, you know, depending on your staffing that day or, you know, how the patient's doing in the hospital, if it's gotten itself worked up by being in house for, you know, an hour waiting for the appointment, then that may change what we do. So I think the most important thing is even though we have, you know, our go-to protocols, we just have to be open to new things. We have to be open to adjusting our, our doses, our route of administration, maybe the drugs we're actually using um, to make sure that it's a safe experience for both the patient and the, the personnel. What are some of the more common drugs you see practitioners using either as single agents or in combination? And how are you seeing that vary based on the type of procedure? Sure, yeah, I think, you know, if you kind of separate your sedatives or tranquilizers into two main kind of groups, you're looking at things that provide some level of light sedation, um, things like acepromazine, the benzodiazepines like midazolam, um, opioids like methadone, hydromorphone, butorphanol. Um, within that, there is always the consideration of whether or not you need some pain control for the procedure you're going to be doing. So um, some of those drugs provide analgesia, some of them don't. So acepromazine, midazolam, you're not going to get any analgesia from it. So if the patient has any sort of pre-existing pain, or if you're going to be inducing any level of pain um, with the procedure you're going to be performing, those drugs are not really going to help you. They might actually make things more difficult because um, they look sedate, but then they respond when you do something. So um, that would be one consideration with those kind of light, you know, sedatives or in acepromazine's uh, situation, it's a tranquilizer, uh, same with midazolam. Um, heavier sedation, I think most practitioners are probably leaning towards more using alpha-2 agonists like metatomidine or dexmedetomidine, combination of a dissociative anesthetic with a benzodiazepine. Um, and then we now have the option of using what are, you know, more classically described as induction agents, propofol, alfaxalone, um, using those drugs, um, you know, at lower doses to maybe get a lighter plane of, of effect. Um, but again, they're anesthetic, so you do run the risk of complications, loss of airway, those sorts of things. So those are the drugs that I think most people are familiar with on their shelf, um, whether they're using as a sole agent or more often, I would say, in combination um, to kind of get the, the best effects of each drug while minimizing the side effects, um, you know, getting away with lower doses of each drug and using them. Um, you know, those are the things I think most veterinarians are going to be using as they're making a decision on that. Yeah, and I would agree. Those are uh, the primary drugs that I reach for and that, and that I have on my shelf. And, you know, always keeping in mind that less drugs does not equal safer anesthesia. Right. No, absolutely. And once the drug is in the body, you know, and again, another consideration is whether they're reversible too. So sure. uh, we haven't talked about that yet, but, you know, acepromazine is not reversible. Um, so once it's in the system, you're going to deal with the good and the bad of that drug for the duration of the effect um, that you've induced. So um, that's another potential consideration. Yeah, and reasons to reach for combinations and get lower doses. And kind of on that topic of combinations, uh, let's talk about Zen Alpha. How is Zen Alpha different from some of the other drugs we use for sedation? And more specifically, how does it differ from metatomidine and dexmedetomidine? Um, so yeah, Zen Alpha is a new product. Um, it's being marketed by Decra, uh, which is a, a company here in the United States um, that has had the drug since kind of midsummer. So uh, June was kind of the first use of the drug in the United States. Um, Zen Alpha is a combination of two drugs, um, metatomidine, which most of us know as veterinarians and, and technicians. Uh, it's probably the more commonly used alpha-2 agonist in small animals at this point. Um, metatomidine first kind of hit the market 20 years ago. So anybody who's graduated in the last 20 years knows metatomidine. And then more recently, dexmedetomidine um, is kind of the purified form of that with the, the one active isomer um, that's, uh, that's commonly used in practice. The other drug with the Zen Alpha, in addition to the metatomidine, is a newer drug um, that most people will not have heard of. Uh, it's called Vatinoxin. Um, this is a drug that's been researched for years and years and is now being marketed in combination with the metatomidine as this new product. Um, it's a one to 20 ratio of the two um, molecules in the solution that we get in the bottle. And basically what it is, vatinoxin 
um, is a peripheral alpha two antagonist. So it's a um, competitive um, antagonist at the receptor where the metatomidine would be working on blood vessels. Um, it's a really clever drug. It does not cross the blood brain barrier. Um, so it doesn't have any central effects. So all of the things we know and love about metatomidine, the analgesia, the sedation, um, the muscle relaxation, all of those beneficial effects of the metatomidine are still intact. But what you don't tend to see is the same degree of vasoconstriction. So you don't see the increase in blood pressure to the same degree that you do with metatomidine uh, or dexmetatomidine when those drugs are used on their own. So for most veterinarians and technicians that are going to start using Zen Alpha, um, it's going to be a different experience. And I think that's probably the key um, as we all start to learn more about this drug. Again, it's only been on the market for four or five months at this point. Um, so the experience we've had with it is, is very positive so far. But one of the things we're learning is that we can't just treat it like a different um, kind of metatomity. And it's almost a new drug entirely because of how it works because of that vatinoxin um, that we're also administering with it. Interesting. And I'm glad you said that because that was going to be my next question is, do you see Zen Alpha kind of replacing dexmedetomidine? I wouldn't say replacing. Um, I think there's absolutely a place for both drugs uh, in our hospitals and in the, the veterinary market. Um, those of us who've been using dexmedetomidine now for over 10, 15 years have really kind of figured out how to use it. Um, you know, I, I think initially when it first came out, I never would have considered using it as a constant rate infusion, for example. We weren't using it for helping smooth out recovery. Uh, we certainly weren't adding it to local anesthetics to, to get more effect from our local blocks. Um, so there's certainly going to be areas where dexmedetomidine and, and metatomidine still has a place as a molecule. And, and I think we have learned how to use these drugs. Um, I think where Zen Alpha has an opportunity is in cases where we may not have wanted to use an alpha-2 previously, um, simply because we don't get the same degree of vasoconstriction with it. Um, I mean, you will see blood pressure go up, but it's not as profound, it's not as long lasting. And because of that, you don't get the same degree of bradycardia. And that's the one that a lot of people have been scared of with using metatomidine or dexmedetomidine for the last 20 years is that, that really low drop in heart rate that, um, that we often try to avoid in certain patients. So. I think, yeah, there's going to be a place for both drugs. Um, right now, the label for Zen Alpha um, does not include perioperative use. So it's not really meant to be used as a premedication prior to general anesthesia. Um, it's not to be used in cats. There are certain things we just need to figure out with the drug at this point. Um, even just combining it with different drugs, what that looks like in terms of the dosing. Um, it's meant for intramuscular use, not intravenous use. There's no added benefit to giving it IV. Um, because it has a rapid onset already. So there's all kinds of things that are very different about this drug um, that I think that that's going to be the fun part, you know, for, for anesthesiologists and then to, to push out that information and disseminate it to our colleagues in, in practice um, is to really highlight where this drug is going to change people's lives, um, change the patient experience in the hospital. I think that's going to be huge. Um, you know, we can talk more about how the drug works and in, in a clinical scenario, if you like. Um, but yeah, I think at this point, my, my expectation is that we will probably still carry both drugs on our shelves um, simply because they work differently and we're going to use them in different situations. Interesting. Interesting. And, uh, you know, kind of along the lines of anesthesiologists figuring out where this drug fits into a lot of our protocols, you've had the chance to use this drug a little bit. Can you tell us about your personal experience using Zen Alpha? I mean, what level of sedation are you getting? Um, mm -hmm. Analgesia, all that good stuff. How are you using it? Yeah, so the analgesia is going to be expected to be similar to dexmedetomidine or metatomidine, and that's just because of the doses that we're using. So we know we're using the Zen Alpha um, in a dose range that would be expected to provide some degree of analgesia. Um, it's as with any alpha two, the duration of the analgesia is shorter than the duration of the sedation that you get. So you do have to kind of plan the procedure to some degree. And if you're doing painful interventions or positioning for radiographs or what have you, you know, you do need to do those things sooner rather than later, um, before the drug does start to wear off. Um, in our hands so far, the patients we've used it on the dogs that we've been using it on, um, the onset is, is quite rapid. Um, one of the cool things about the vatinoxin is it actually enhances the absorption of other drugs that it's given with. So uh, if you're giving it with, in this case, metatomidine, or in some of the other studies where they've combined it with midazolam, for example, or butorphanol, 
the onset and the, the pharmacokinetics of those other drugs are also affected by the co-administration of the vatinoxin. So the onset is actually enhanced because you're not getting local vasoconstriction. Um, so overall, the drug does hit the body quicker. So the onset of sedation is faster um, in a lot of cases. Um, the dogs that we've used it on are are good and sedate within three or four minutes of an IM injection, which is, I think, much quicker than we see with, with other alpha-2 formulations. Um, and then because there's more uh, maintenance of their cardiovascular system, the blood flow to the liver, the clearance of the drug is actually maintained better. So the recovery is going to be quicker as well. And what we've seen is we can have a dog, um, we had to do some um, x-rays on a, on a rescue dog last week, for example, gave it the label dose of uh, Zen Alpha. Um, it was a pretty bouncy kind of pity mix um, that was down within three or four minutes. We got our radiographs. We were able to do a good physical exam. She'd had a previous FHO procedure and they were just looking at whether or not a revision was needed. So the surgeons were able to examine her, um, you know, come up with a plan. And then at around the 35 minute mark, she was starting to spontaneously recover from the drug without any reversal. And by 45 minutes, she was standing and we were able to discharge her at an hour um, back to the rescue. So um, very different experience. The recoveries are spontaneous in a lot of cases. You don't have to reverse them. You can, and they can, uh, you can see good reversal with adapamazole like you would with, with other alpha twos. Um, but in a lot of cases, you don't have to. The, the patient actually is able to uh, clear the drug, metabolize the drug without um, any prolonged effects. So another thing that's kind of cool and a little bit different about using Zen Alpha versus our other um, more longstanding Alpha 2 options. Yeah, that's very cool. I was going to ask you about reversal. And, and I love that, that you most of the time they'll spontaneously recover. Yeah, it certainly increases the efficiency of your team. You don't have to uh, you know, give another injection in a lot of cases. Um, you certainly can. And we've, we have done that um, in a couple of cases where they just weren't quite where we wanted them by the time the owners were ready to go. Um, so we would just give them, um, you know, just a, a low end of the adipamisole dose just to kind of make sure that they were completely recovered before discharge. Um, but in a lot of cases, we haven't had to reverse at all. You know, the onset and, and the recoveries are, are quite a bit different than we're used to. What about your pulse ox? Does your pulse ox work when you're using Zen Alpha? Uh, we haven't had a lot of experience with the pulse oximeter. I mean, certainly the color of the patients looks better. Um, their pulses and everything physically on, on physical exam are, are well-maintained. Um, we've put a pulse ox on a couple of them just out of interest, as opposed to what we normally do for sedation for radiographs or something like that. Um, and they do saturate, you know, in the mid nineties and above. So on room air, that's, that's pretty good. The fact yeah, that, yeah. Do, I mean, the fact, and, and the fact that it's reading at all, that's great. Exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say the same thing. That's, that's always a good thing. So, um, yeah. And that's again, just due to the nature of the drug, it's, it's a different drug. So expect your monitors to work differently. Expect the things that you look at physically in terms of mucous membrane color, cap refill time, peripheral pulses, all of those things are going to be a little bit different with Sen Alpha. Absolutely. What about the dosing protocol? Um, you mentioned that you gave the label dose of Zen Alpha. Is this something where we kind of tailor our dose based on what we're doing, or is it is there a label dose and you give you give this dose every time? I think at this point, you know, we're pretty happy using the label doses just because it is a new drug, um, and we just want to make sure that we're we're learning from it um, as we're going along. We want to you know, at least follow with what the company's, you know, large field studies have shown as opposed to just expecting that we know more than the company. So I think that's important. Um, the label doses are high compared to what you would be used to uh, using with metatomidine or dexmedetomidine. And again, that gets back to the fact that this is a different drug and we have to think about it differently um, because of that batinoxin effect. Um, so it's dosed on a meter squared body surface area, um, which again is how most of us were initially using metatomidine and, and dexmedetomidine. That, that is how they are dosed. Um, now we've uh, in experience over time converted that into micrograms per kilo. Um, but, and you know, that may happen with the Zen Alpha at some point, but at this point we've been using the label doses and depending on the size of the patient, you're anywhere, you know, between around 17 micrograms per kilo for a large, large breed dog. Um, down to around 30 or 35 microgram per kilo equivalent dose for a small patient. Um, so again, higher than you might be used to using with metatomidine, but the fact is um, that is how much they need to get the equivalent dose of sedation because it doesn't last as long. They're going to go through it quicker because the increased clearance and all those other effects. 
Um, so again, that's why we know it's analgesic. We're well within that analgesic range, um, but the doses are going to be a little bit different than you're used to. So as long as you're okay with that, uh, it's certainly worth doing. Yeah. And I mean, I, I like the idea of sticking with the label dose. I think that that, that kind of takes some of the guesswork out of it. And like you said, if things kind of evolve as time goes on and we use it more than then great. But um, I, I think that you're having these excellent effects of patients who are sedated quickly and then spontaneously recover with using the label dose. Sounds great. Yeah. And I, I like any drug, we're going to learn more. Um, a lot of colleagues are very, very interested in, in working with DECRA on you know, figuring out what doses to use in combination and how to top them up up if we need another dose um, for longer procedures, those types of things. And then certainly from a perioperative standpoint, you know, what does it look like if we then induce anesthesia, intubate them, put them on inhalant? Um, what does that look like? There's some early studies that are coming out looking at that right now as well. So I think at least in the first, you know, few months here, first year, um, you know, certainly using it at label doses is, is appropriate and, and probably prudent. Um, and then like anything, we will learn, we will figure out what works. Um, there's going to be situations, scenarios where we might need to change that a little bit. And once we have that uh, information and background, we'll be more confident making those decisions. We talked about all these different drugs. We talked about benzos and opioids and ketamine and, you know, and telazole and all these different things. Um, so obviously we have a lot of options out there and Zen Alpha utilizes metatomidine, which is something we've had around for a long time. Why is having this new drug combination so important to the market? Um, again, I think it just gives us options. You know, we, in the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, have had drugs come and go. Um, certainly opioids, depending on the hospital, are, are hard to get a hold of reliably. We've often had to change the opioid that we're using um, just because of availability. Um, you know, even for a period of time, our, our alpha twos were, were kind of in short supply and propofol was gone for a while. So, I mean, number one, I think it just gives veterinarians and, and veterinary team members more more options. Um, you know, again, it's, it's a different drug. You're going to use it for potentially different scenarios that you would with the other drugs. So, um, you know, it, we've, we've learned to use dexmedetomidine in ways that we didn't initially think we would for some patients. Um, you know, again, those with certain heart murmurs, this drug does give us that option that, you know, if they have background potential disease, even though the label is for, for healthy, what we call ASA one and two patients, the healthy patients with no systemic disease, you know, again, I think research will, will show that we do have a, a place for it. Um, it's going to be off label. Um, you know, I'm not here to, to tell you to use that on, in patients right now with, with certain conditions. I think at some point we may learn that we can do that. Um, but again, options are important. We, we don't know where the market's going to go. As veterinarians, we pride ourselves on on having multiple resources available to us. And I think this is going to be another really good resource that we have. Absolutely. And I think I heard you say this earlier, but just to make sure that I heard you correctly, can Zen Alpha be used in cats? Uh, not at this point. No, uh, the drug is only labeled in the United States for uh, use in dogs and canine patients. Um, it will undoubtedly be labeled for cats at some point, but the way the vatinoxin uh, antagonist at the alpha-2 receptors works, the ratio that uh, works for cats is different than dogs. Um, so the formulation that uh, inevitably will come out for cats will be a little bit different in terms of that 1 to 20 ratio. Um, the current formulation is more likely to cause hypotension, low blood pressure in cats. Um, so it's just a matter of getting the optimal ratio of those two drugs together for uh, a better safety profile. So no, I would not recommend using the current dog formulation in cats, even though the metatomidine is what you would expect and, and we know it would work. The side effects are just probably not appropriate for a cat based on the dosing. So um, definitely not a recommendation at this point. Well, Dr. Reed, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me today. Is there anything else you want to share with everyone? No, I think overall, it's just, yeah, really exciting to have a new drug available to us. Um, you know, I think we're always looking for, for other options for anesthesia and procedural sedation because of the nature of the patients that come through our door. Um, they all have different issues and different drugs are going to work better for them. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great time right now. We're coming out of the pandemic with supply chain issues no longer being an issue. So we can certainly access the drugs we're used to using. And it's great to have a new drug that we can learn how to use appropriately um, just to, again, support our patients and improve patient safety and their experience when they're in the hospital.
Wonderful. Well, we look forward to hearing all of the new information that continues to come to light. So Dr. Reed, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. And thank you to DECRA for sponsoring this edition of vet to vet Check out the NAVC's vetfolio.com for more of our B2B discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.